An ancient legend tells of the beginning of the world. Long ago, all living things lay in wait under the earth. People, wildlife, and especially great herds of buffalo. One day, the ground opened up and buffalo came pouring out. They thundered over the land in countless numbers, darkening the plains. The people followed the buffalo out of the ground and set foot on open land. Buffalo lay in every direction. The people looked around and knew this place was meant for them, they and the buffalo together. But the legend couldn't foretell the buffalo's near extermination and how the people lost everything. When the buffalo disappeared, their way of life had changed forever. But today, the buffalo are making a comeback, bringing about a reawakening of Native American culture. The true name for these great beasts is the bison, but most Americans know this animal as the buffalo. Their ancestors came to North America from Asia during the Ice Ages. They became the greatest group of large mammals on the Earth. For the Plains Indians, the buffalo was indispensable. Every bit of the animal was used. Shields from buffalo skin, axes from shoulder blades, needles made from bone, even soup ladles from its horns. But there was more. Buffalo were at the center of their spiritual life. John Lame Deer once wrote, everything we needed for life came from the buffalo's body. It was hard to say where the animal ended and the man began. In 1806, Lewis and Clark witnessed a moving multitude that darkened the plains from one horizon to the other. An army officer wrote, the whole country was covered with a monstrous moving brown blanket. Newcomers to the West exploited this new resource. Their wagon trails and railroads cut into the heart of the Great Plains, giving them easy access to Buffalo. Buffalo robes became very popular and hunters got rich killing bison for their hides. The buffalo slaughter had begun. Buffalo Bill, hired to feed the railroad gangs, single-handedly killed over 4,200 buffalo in less than two years. After the Civil War, the U.S. Army was finally free to deal with the Indian problem out west. They knew without the buffalo, the Native Americans couldn't survive. The government's solution was simple. Eliminate the buffalo. Indian fighter General Philip Sheridan declared, hunters are destroying the Indian's commissary. For the sake of a lasting peace, let them kill, skin, and sell until the buffaloes are exterminated. Millions of buffalo were slaughtered for their meat, tongues, and hides. In just three years, hunters in Texas and Kansas killed over six million buffaloes. The newcomers profited from every part of the animal. Even the skulls and bones were crushed for fertilizer. In the slaughter of the buffalo, the Indians saw their own fate. Sitting Bull said, a cold wind blew across the prairie, a death wind for my people. Plenty Coup, chief of the crows, wrote, when the buffalo went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground, and they could not lift them up again. There was little singing anywhere. Overnight, the voice of a nation was silenced, until now. Buffalo are the very center of our, uh, of our culture. 
Buffalo were our whole economy at one time. So it's pretty hard to even continue or even have a culture without them. And yet, when uh, the tribes, you know, lost the buffalo, lost that physical relationship because of the slaughter, uh, you know, the, the very heart of the culture itself was just stripped away. Fred Dubray is a Lakota Indian leader who lives on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. He has a lifelong mission to bring the buffalo back to tribal lands. As Indian people, it's our last hope. Because if we can't save these buffalo, if these buffalo can't be preserved and protected the way they need to be, then neither can we. We can't exist either. Because that's what they represent to us. They're that important. The government's plan to exterminate buffalo was nearly accomplished. By 1902, only 23 bison were found in the wild, a small herd hidden in Yellowstone National Park. Just 500 more were scattered among zoos and private ranches. The near extinction of the bison caused an outcry among conservationists at the turn of the century. To build up the wild herd, Congress sent captive bison to Yellowstone. Protected by the very government that had ordered their destruction, the buffalo could now recover, but within the confines of the park. A similar fate befell the Native Americans. After living as free as the buffalo, the Native people were confined to reservations. In a few places, the Wild West still lives on. Buffalo dot the landscape in modest herds. Today, almost 2,500 live in Yellowstone. It's one of the greatest comeback stories in conservation history. At over two million acres, Yellowstone is a refuge for wild animals that make up our American wilderness. For the past 25 years, biologist and wildlife filmmaker Franz Kamensen has been documenting the bison's amazing comeback to Yellowstone National Park. Franz is careful never to get too close to these massive animals. A full-grown bull can weigh over 2,000 pounds and stand six feet tall. I think the buffalo fascinates me because it is such a uh, almost primitive animal and yet so majestic. Buffalo can be dangerous because they're so big and they tend to be very passive in their nature and they're not particularly active but it's very deceiving because they're very very fast and if you get too close to them they're as apt to come up to you and just butt you, lift you up, uh, gore you with their horns. They're deceptively dangerous. It's springtime on the high plateau. Hidden away in a wooded area, this newborn calf is taking its first tentative steps. Bison may look large and ungainly, but they're built for speed. With predators like wolves nipping at their heels, they've evolved into long-distance runners. Thus, a calf learns to walk within minutes of its birth and learns quickly to keep up with the herd. The calf is completely dependent on its mother. Should the all-important bond between them break down, the mother might abandon her newborn. 
it's brand new. It hasn't seen it before. It hasn't smelt it before. It hasn't tasted it before. She hadn't had this little thing following it around for a year. And now all of a sudden it's there, and, it, and she has to learn that. And licking it, smelling it, touching it forms that bond. Bison are social animals. As soon as the calves join the herd, they form close ties with one another. The herd is remarkably protective of their young. Should predators appear, the adults quickly surround the helpless calves. Sadly, this protective instinct was no match for the buffalo hunters of the late 1800s. But when there were almost no buffalo left, just a handful of men used the buffalo's own behavior to save them. Their solution was to separate the wild bison calves from their mothers. To do this, they had to resort to extreme measures. They would run a herd until the calves got tired and fell behind. Calves, with their strong herding instincts, would then follow the men's horses. Other calves were captured with lassos. Taken to private ranches, they would be raised by domesticated cows. The gamble worked. Bison multiplied on ranches while they disappeared on the plains. Later, the grown calves were sent to re-establish bison herds in parks and private ranches around the country. It was the action of a few thoughtful men that have helped ensure future generations of wild calves such as these. It's really comforting to watch a herd of bison because they'll have the calves in there and they'll just start running around, chasing each other and bonking around, uh, jumping off their forefeet at once. Uh, it's you can only describe it as a parent happiness on their part. There's something about it that even the expression on their face makes you think that they're having a good time. Spring is the time of year for calves to grow and build up their strength. At birth, they weigh about 50 pounds. During calving season, adults are especially alert. Predators often single out calves. This mother cow quickly pushes the errant ones back into the safety of the group. Bison are always alert. There are real predators out there. They may not always look like they're uh, on sentinel, so to speak, but uh, they don't miss much, and it's very difficult to sneak up on bison. If one doesn't see you, one of the other hundred will, and that's enough, and that's part of their protective mechanism. Fortunately, this juvenile cougar is too inexperienced to kill a calf. The wolf is a different story. Wolves were returned to Yellowstone only recently. Their reintroduction has profoundly affected every animal there. The wolf is the bison's natural predator. Working together, a pack, like this one in Canada, can encircle and kill a buffalo. many predators, bison thrived in Yellowstone, and their defenses became lax. Wolves keep them vigilant.
Yellowstone is no longer the only place in North America with bison. Today, over 150,000 bison live in other parks and ranches across America. And, best of all, the bison have come home to Indian lands. Fred Dubray had founded the Intertribal Bison Co-op to bring about this very mission. This bull, he's really excited about something, see, and he's going around. But he's, uh, you see his tail goes up a little bit in the air. And the higher the tail goes up, the more of a threat they are. They'll warn you all the time. Fred's knowledge helps Native Americans raise bison on 45 different reservations. My grandfather taught me about this particular piece of land, talking about how if you take care of the land, they take care of you. Respect the things on it, you take care of it, it'll give that back to you and take care of you. There's no better way to take care of the land than having these buffalo out here taking care of it. They're part of the natural order of things out here. So you start combining all the things that have been here for thousands of years, reestablishing those relationships, and everything becomes real healthy again, and the whole ecosystem benefits, and consequently the whole world benefits. At the annual Crow Fair in Montana, Indians from around the country gather to celebrate their culture and the return of the buffalo. There's a deep belief among these people that whatever happens to the buffalo happens to them. Jennifer Flatlip explains. We were a very proud people. We were very much a part and balance with earth and wildlife. We both now are coming out. The buffalo is strong and our buffalo are healthy. We're strong. Our pride is there and strong. We're thriving. I really believe that we really have a, a spiritual connection to our wildlife. And that in itself gives us a lot of pride. At powwows around the country, Native Americans are rediscovering their cultural past and the spirit of a forgotten people is rising. Jennifer Flatlip is a Native American history teacher on the Crow Reservation. She finds lessons in the past that renew Native pride. And for the young people, they have the greatest experience now because it's okay to be Native American. And in this day and age where many societies are falling apart, we are becoming whole again. And when we see the wildlife free and, and wild and nourishing, then we know that we will be too. It's summer in Yellowstone. The calves are now a few months old. They've gained several hundred pounds, but still lack the distinctive hump. The entire herd is moving into one of the most intense times of the year, breeding season. The bulls are in perfect condition and grow more belligerent each day. It's at this time of year that the bison encounter another nomadic animal, the tourist. I think too many people don't understand how dangerous and how big a bison really is. There's just no question that one flip of the head, run those horns through your body, crush your chest, uh, toss you in the air, uh, and it happens every year. There are more humans injured by bison in Yellowstone than any of the other animals in the park. 
you think they're just sort of big lumbering lawn mowers out there, and yet they're not. They're just uh, nimble, and they're very fast, and can be very aggressive. Loud bellows fill the summer air. The rut is in full swing. It's a real guttural sound that the bulls make, and uh, <laughs> something like that. Uh, in the springtime, when the bulls are not acting like this, I can make that kind of sound, and oftentimes the calves will get real alert, and I think they identify it as maybe a mother's call or something like that. I can't really tell if they answer back or not, but every once in a while they certainly do look at me and it seems like they start responding again, whether that is a, a stimulation for them or not, I don't know. For most of the year, males and females live apart. Now, a bull enters the herd and selects a female in heat. He will not leave her side, remaining within five feet of her, patiently waiting for her permission to mate. It's the cow's decision whether to accept him or not. The bull can spend up to three days following her around. He's so focused on guarding his selected cow, he rarely stops to eat. During the rut, a courting bull can lose nearly 200 pounds. A dominant bull reinforces his superiority with certain aggressive signals. His tail goes up. He bellows. He paws and wallows in the dirt. The wallows really serve a purpose to express dominance. They'll actually paw the ground and they'll tear up the ground. Sometimes they'll actually use their head and their horns to tear up the ground. And then they'll wallow in that hole that they've made. Sometimes they'll urinate on it first and then wallow in that so that that scent gets on their body and probably sends out a bigger signal in the herd that I'm here, I'm the boss. When the threatening postures don't work, the bulls resort to fighting. An ancient tradition is about to play out on the Great Plains, the Buffalo Roundup, but with a modern twist. High atop the Bighorn Mountains of Montana, the tribe operates the largest and one of the oldest of the Indian-owned herds. Bounded on three sides by canyon walls, the Crow raised their 1,000 head of buffalo in one of the most remote areas in the U.S., a location inaccessible except by horseback and helicopter eight months out of the year. Though it will be difficult and dangerous to round up these bison, it is important that the tribe bring them in to test them and vaccinate them against disease. The crow have a healthy herd and want to keep it that way.
Raising bison creates year-long jobs for the buffalo soldiers, as they like to call themselves. Buffalo are fast, faster than most horses, running up to 45 miles an hour. They also have amazing endurance, galloping for hours without tiring. A horse that can keep up with buffalo and has the courage to move in close is highly prized. The work is dangerous since the woolly beast can charge the men on horseback at any time. The crow prepare for the roundup, just as their ancestors did. They build a barrier to help funnel the buffalo into a corral. Bison are wild, unpredictable animals, and Vernon Whiteman, head of natural resources for the tribe, worries that 500 tons of stampeding buffalo could charge right through the barrier. Well, basically, the buffalo, if they see an opening, we had just very little opening. They'll try to go through that. They'll go through anything that's just barely open. And one goes, they all go. That's how we end up with what we call our buffalo wrecks. As soon as you see a wreck, we'll say, boy, there's that wreck. After days of careful planning, they're ready. The air is charged with anticipation. But first, herding the buffalo is done by helicopter. It's the only way to find these wild and inaccessible animals, scattered in small groups across the plateau. By guiding the lead animal in the right direction, the rest of the herd will follow. It's very tricky business. And just go right up below the here. Yeah. Clarence Three Irons, the buffalo herd manager, helps the pilot direct the bison. Hey, these two trails right here? Yeah. You want to bring them through here first. OK. Get up below the aspens and go across with them right there. I'm going to show you where to go. job of the buffalo soldiers to herd the bison into the corral. You see them north to south of the bulls? They're not too big, you know that? The roundup is a success. Clarence Three Irons and Vernon Whiteman inspect the herd. They will vaccinate the calves and also send a few to other Indian reservations to help increase their bison population. That thing is kind of tough one there. We better get out of here before we get a wreck. I used to be able to jump over these gates. 102 years old, you can't, can't fly like you used to. <laughs> Most Indian reservations were considered marginal land, too tough to ranch or farm. Now, they're strongholds for the buffalo an irony that has not been lost on Fred Dubray. You look out here in this part of the country where there used to be millions of buffalo, I mean millions. But what's really ironic 
is all those natural beauties and, and uh, the things that existed, it's all pretty much wiped out. Indian reservations were created on the worst possible piece of the ground that nobody wanted anything else to do with. The desert, ground that couldn't grow anything, uh, wasteland, basically. Those what became Indian reservations. And nowadays, those same Indian reservations are some of the best land that's left. So these little islands of a reservation, I see as, as a really the last hope to bring things back into that natural state. Bison are migratory animals, and keeping them inside boundaries is a challenge. Indian reservations are no longer open and unbroken, but divided up among many different property owners. Last winter, on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, one of Fred Dubray's bulls left the herd. Still on the loose, the bull is considered by Fred's neighbors to be a dangerous outcast. Fred has tried several times to round him up, but the bull has eluded every effort. Unable to bring him back, Fred must take drastic action. I'm not quite sure where this where this bull's at yet, but uh, once he comes inside, I don't really want to spook him or nothing. You know, they must be a ways down there yet because I see Mike going way up there. Yet, so I want to get up there. You got these other guys. The neighboring ranchers want the bull off their property. Gone. Gone. I can't find it. He was right over there when the last time I seen him, an hour and a half ago. That's where he was, he was standing right down that bottom. I went back up that way. Everything's different every single time. You try to plan to work with these buffalo, it don't work, never works. You know, they'll do something different every time, so no matter how hard you try to get it all set up, get it to work and right, it never work. And it becomes real frustrating if you don't understand that and don't work with them that way. Mike Dubray, Fred's nephew, cites the runaway bull. Right over the hill. Yeah. You have to right over there, that little jar and across the people. Oh yeah, I see him. Moving out pretty good, huh? Well, I cut him off over there here. Just try to hold him up there, right about where he's at, I guess, the best you can. Okay. But he's looking this way, too. He knows something's going on. I'm wondering, maybe Helping I Fred is his friend Jim Garrett. Gonna... Yeah, yeah. Just to keep him up here. Tatanka itself means the biggest and the baddest of all of the bulls. And he is uh, one of those outlaws that refuses to present himself. He will run until the time is right, and then he will present himself he will turn and look us dead on and and he, we will know that that's the time that he's sacrificing himself. has entered a sacred area where the tribe performs their sun dance ceremonies. Fred decides not to shoot until the bull moves on. Would this work out the window? Or? I don't know if 
that'll never shot one between the eyes with this thing before. I don't think it would even penetrate his head. These massive bulls are hard to kill. The impact of several bullets often won't slow them down. I think he just decided to, he understood that it was time, he was ready to go, I was ready to, to do it. It's important that you look each other in the eye, you have that understanding because, you know, you're taking life, it's a very significant kind of thing. And you understand the importance of what you're doing and, and the consequences of your actions. It's not something that I like to do, but I understand it's necessary. I can for these buffalo and I, I made a commitment not only to myself but to my tribe and to them a long time ago that that's the way it would be and uh, so basically I've given my life to them it's only fair they give their life to me now and then. sometimes death can be a celebration you know and it's just another part of life is really all it is A kill ceremony represents that celebration, giving thanks and apologizing at the same time for the actions that you're taking and asking the buffalo to forgive you and understand what you're doing. It's not a big deal. It is very important that you do that each and every time because to keep yourself in balance and keep yourself in line and make sure you understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and you don't get out of control. As a final tribute to the animal, everyone shares a ceremonial cup of the bison's blood. The ceremonies that we have and the prayers that we say is apologizing to the animal, but uh, also, you know, at the same time asking for his understanding and, uh, and respect, you know, because it has to be that way. And we're recognizing by, by maintaining that respect, we're ensuring the health of the herd itself just like any other predator. That's one of the primary functions how a predator benefits a herd of animals is that they eliminate the weak ones a lot of times. They keep the numbers down, the population in balance. That's part of that natural balance of nature. As bison meat had once nourished their ancestors, this bull's meat will feed the tribe. Fred Dubray helps run the reservation's portable slaughterhouse, the first in America. 
This makes it possible for bison to be processed on site. The tribe keeps the hides, skulls, and special parts of the animal for ceremonial use. Some of the Plains Indians lived almost entirely on a diet of bison meat. It is higher in protein, but lower in calories, fat, and cholesterol than beef. Fred hopes the demand for bison will increase, giving jobs to the young people on the reservation. next six months, winter takes hold of Yellowstone. It's a precarious time for bison. The winters here can be especially brutal, but the park offers places of respite for the animals, little oases of warmth around the hot springs and thermal geysers. Bison are built for cold. They can even handle temperatures that plunge 70 degrees below zero with their thick winter coats and extra layers of fat to keep them warm. Their large, powerful heads act as snow plows. Their humps are the muscles that support their mammoth heads, giving them the power to push the deep snow out of the way. Their highly developed sense of smell tells them where to dig. They can detect the scent of grass even under several feet of snow. Despite these advantages, bison can still starve or freeze to death during a harsh spell. The bison walk slowly through the deep snow in a single line. The lead animal blazes a path, making it easier for the rest of the herd to follow, especially the younger ones. If an animal somehow strays from the herd, it can easily find itself in trouble. Stranded in deep snow, without a packed down trail to follow, this young animal struggles for its life. The herd is powerless to help him. They must continue on. There's little here to eat. As the herd moves on, their trek takes them across frozen rivers, a treacherous prospect in winter. During severe winters, bison migrate to lower elevations where there's less snow and more access to food. Sometimes this takes them outside the park. 
Some of these animals may have been exposed to a disease called brucellosis. Even though there has been no evidence of wild bison transmitting this disease to cattle, the state of Montana is unwilling to take the risk. Unlike other wildlife, if bison leave the park's boundaries and enter national forest land, they will be destroyed. During the terrible winter of 1996, more than 1,000 bison were shot, killing nearly one-third of the Yellowstone herd. This practice can still happen any time bison leave the park. Winters in Yellowstone are long and difficult. Spring is a welcome relief for the survivors. On this spring morning, there is excitement in the air. These children are from the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, and they've come to watch a very special ceremony in honor of the return of buffalo to their tribe. Oh. Can you see the buffalo? Yeah. Okay. How do you say buffalo in Indian, guys? Katanka. Katanka. There we go. Oh. A small herd is being reintroduced to this corner of the prairie. It's a moment of pride for Jim Garrett, who participates in the buffalo ceremony. Our culture and our, especially our spirituality was outlawed by the federal government. And we were never really given that right back to practice our religious ceremonies until 1978. Now that we have recovered our traditions, we feel it's really important for the young to, to be exposed to that because we weren't. Instead of looking back with bitterness, these people have achieved a vision for the future. Rocky Afraid of Hawk, a spiritual leader of the tribe, seeks to connect the children with their heritage. Thanksgiving prayer was just a Thanksgiving, you call it Wopila in Lakota, thanking the buffalo for be, still being here on earth. And without him, we'd be nothing. The bison, the buffalo, Tatunka is sacred. When you pray with a pipe through them, thing, all things are possible for one's health, one's well-being. With Tatunka in the area, when we brought them back to our people, they brought the sense of pride back and pride of who they are. So this animal has done wonders for our people especially little children. There's a lot of faith there in those prayers. And it's been my experience that when you pray with that pipe, you pray in a good way, it's gonna come true. What you pray for is going to come true. It might not be tomorrow like most people want, but it might be that it will come true for your children. One of the things that I see happening today is some of the prayers that they said a hundred years ago is just now coming true. You know, like the resurgence of the buffalo. That's happening, but it's happening a hundred years later. Are you patient enough to wait for your prayers to be answered for a hundred years? We are, you know, we are. These people have long understood a simple truth, that saving the buffalo means saving themselves. Both were on the brink of extinction and miraculously both have made a comeback. Together, strengthened by their indomitable spirit, they look forward to the new millennium.
probably half my life's gone already. And it's going to take a long time to really see these buffalo come back in, in the numbers that I'd like to see them. But I believe they will. So all I can do is start that process. But it's really important to keep the process going, keep the understanding going to the younger generations because they're the ones that have to make it happen and keep it going. But the other important part is that those buffalo have to be there because they're the real teachers. So to me, that's what these buffalo represent is restoring that harmony, restoring that balance and that respect. And I think we can do that. When the nightfall comes, we rest in peace. I believe the buffalo has a sense of peace in the night, the tranquility of the night, as we do. We have some sense of peace in the darkness because in the morning when the sun rises, it is our hope that we will thrive as people and they will thrive as wildlife.